Broadcasting from the heart of Soviet Kanakistan. What is this state thing going next? Hey, welcome to the Great White North. It's better red than dead with Redmond Weissenberger. Okay, welcome kind listeners. It is Friday, April 18th, 2014, and this is your host, Redmond Weisenberger, Executive Director of the Mises Institute of Canada, Mises.ca, and Managing Editor of the Dollar Vigilante. For all your expatriation needs, when you need to get your ass out of Dodge, and your assets out of Dodge, uh, go to red, R-E-D, dot dollar vigilante, dot com, and check it out. Now, joining us today is Stefan Kinsella. Stefan is a libertarian attorney in Houston and the executive editor of the Libertarian Papers. He is also the author of the book Against IP, published by the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. Welcome, Stefan. Thanks very much, Revan. Hey, so I've had you on in the past sort of to discuss sort of intellectual property ideas and whatnot on my on my YouTube channel. But now that I'm running my podcast, I was thinking I got to get uh, Stefan in here because he always has so many insights into what's going on in the world. This world that seems to be uh, in a lot of ways dictated to us by so many. Um, I mean, it seems to be carved out and formed by all sorts of different kinds of laws, doesn't it? Absolutely does, and um, positive law, state legislation, a growing mass of international law, and uh, and IP law, and other laws are of course a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And I wanted, I guess there was sort of a funny. I saw this on uh, <laughs> I saw this on Facebook, so I decided to share it. And I think I wanted to um, I wanted to share it with you because uh, I thought you might appreciate it. It's uh, the title is it's from the Manchester Evening News. And the title is Little Rooney 3 told he can't have his name on an Easter egg because it would breach copyright. <laughs> so this is um, this the, the staff of a company called Thornton's refused to put this um, this toddler's name on uh, on his egg because uh, it was the same name as a footballer. And for those in the United States and Canada who don't know what a footballer is, that means you actually play soccer. Now, uh, what's pretty funny about what's interesting about this is that somebody had put down um, uh, right under somebody had put uh, put down right under uh, uh, this post on Facebook a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville, of course, who wrote the book, and this is from Democracy in America, and it, and the quote is it's from the chapter on what democracies have to fear. And he said, society will develop a new kind of servitude which covers the surface of society with a network of complicated rules through which the most original minds and most energetic characters cannot penetrate. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, enervates, extinguishes, and stupefies a people till each nation is reduced to nothing better than a flock of timid and industrious animals of which the the government is the shepherd. So why don't we start with this story and that quote? So, yeah, the story is interesting. It's just another example of... um well, we're talking about the control the government asserts over society uh, in the name of IP. One way they do it is they make companies like this little bakery afraid to do things. Yeah. You can't really you can't blame them because they're afraid of secondary liability or or whatever. This is the same reason YouTube takes down videos um, when there's even a threat of um, a potential copyright issue or this DMCA takedown notice filed, even if it's without merit. Or even if there's a fair use defense, so these companies become um, gun shy, which leads to a chilling effect on what you can do with your own property or contracts. Um, uh, another example I heard um, recently was, um, um, I think, is Dropbox. Uh, someone actually posted a, a screenshot of what happened when they tried to share a file on in their own Dropbox account privately with another person, and Dropbox had a notice that this. This file may contain copyrighted content. Um, oh no way! Which, wow. which means that Dropbox is actually looking at the contents of private data that you think of as sort of your hard drive in the sky. Yeah, 
uh, or at least they have a hashtag associated with it, which correlates with some hashtag that looks like it's copyrighted material. So it's getting out of control. Uh, so the effect of these laws is to incentivize companies to be very careful. Mm-hmm. And so they're just, you know, so reputable companies have a lot to lose. So they're the ones who implement these things because they're, they're risk averse. So yeah, that well, means you're going to have to go to shady companies and two bit fly by night companies to start getting your copy jobs done or whatever, or your <laughs> cakes made with your, your son's name on the cake. Well, it's so funny. I mean, yeah, when I, I think I just had some, I guess there's a place called Staples or Office Depot. I think you have it in the States as well. Um, but I just uploaded a couple things there to be printed. And of course, yeah, it came with the standard boiler, boiler plate, you know, make sure that you, do you have right. uh, permission to, uh, to publish this or make a copy of this. And of course I said, yes. Yeah. So, and I actually did, of course, but, um, it's so funny as well with these companies like drop Dropbox, you know, I, I, just now I went to their uh, terms of service and they try to make it really friendly and relaxed. Right. But it's like, so it's like your stuff and your permissions, your mm-hmm. stuff is mm-hmm. yours. These, <laughs> these terms don't give us any rights to your stuff, except for the limited rights that enables us to offer services. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's, it's so funny. The, uh, and then they do, but they do have a DMCA policy. Dropbox yep. respects yep. the intellectual property rights of others and expects users to do the same. So there you go. Well, what was unique about this recent case was, okay, Dropbox, if they're, sh- if you're sharing your link publicly to anyone who can download it, it's more like a YouTube kind of case. So you can see Dropbox getting concerned, but if I send you a private email link, so it's like me sending a file just to you and no mm-hmm. one else in the world can see that. In this case, Dropbox still monitored it with the hashtag and they, they, they detected a possible copyright infringement and warned the guy or blocked it or something like that, which is, you know, very troubling. And this, this just highlights the fact that you cannot have both, just like you can't have positive welfare rights and negative rights, right? They have, one has to come at the expense of the other. You can't have a right to an education and food and housing and a job and the right to your private property protected because the positive rights have to come at the expense of the others. Mm-hmm. You can't have, you can't have them both. Same way you can't have intellectual property rights and property rights in material things. One has to bend. And in fact, intellectual property rights are just a way of reassigning property rights and things, which which we can get to in a second in the servitude issue. But mm-hmm. um, let me give you one more example I've read about. It. You can find examples of this on my c4sif.org uh, blog. Um, you know, there's been threats in recent years um, by copyright holders against uh, like famous people or even regular people who have tattoos. If the, ta- if the tattoo oh is of some copyrighted or maybe trademarked uh, term, yeah. So you know, I mean, they're threatening to basically control people's bodies. I mean, what's what's the result of the lawsuit going to be against someone who has a tattoo on their face of Mickey Mouse? Do they have to, do they have to go to a doctor and have the tattoo removed? Oh I mean, my god! This is god. like a form of almost slavery or or physical uh, coercion against someone's body. Well, yeah, um, for sure. So what I found interesting about the de Tocqueville servitude comment, um, he was writing, you know, what, a couple hundred, 150 years ago or something. Right, yeah. And he, he points out that in democracy you're going to see this web of servitude sweep the earth, which controls people's freedom of action. Mm-hmm. Now, he writes in a little bit more flowery language, and the word servitude is used in a technical sense by lawyers like me, but also most people think of servitude as like bondage or – some kind of um, you know indentured servitude, like so when you're someone's temporary slave, basically, or temporary worker. Um, and so I'm not sure if to talk about a minute in that sense or in the technical legal sense. The technical legal sense of a servitude in the civil law, the continental law, the Roman law, the French law, uh, Louisiana law, uh, and I think Quebec. Um, the term servitude is roughly equivalent to what the common law calls an easement. It's sort of like a partial property right or mm-hmm. a property right for someone to do something. Right. With someone else's property. Um, well, so like when it, I when I have an easement to to say if my – for a driveway for my car or something like that. Exactly. So the, yeah. the easement is like a partial property right. You got you have the right to drive over it, but the the bear, the owner of the basic land has the right to do everything else to it. He just can't yes. stop you from driving over it. And usually those are negotiated contractually, so there's no problem with servitudes 
or easements in the libertarian sense as long as they're contractually negotiated, mm -hmm. um, just like a sale of property. Um, so if I transfer my property to you by outright sale, there's nothing wrong with that under libertarian theory. That's an exercise of your property rights. Mm -hmm. But if the government takes it from you by eminent domain, we regard that as theft, even if it's compensated. It's still a type of theft or trespass against your property. So the, the key issue is not the transfer or how the transfer is done or what type of transfer it is. It's whether it's voluntary and consented to by the owner or not. Um, now, in, in, in the law, there's different types of servitudes. The one you gave would be a, more like a right of use or a right of way or some kind of uh, limited servitude defined by the agreement to, to have a driveway or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's another type of servitude. It's more like it's called a negative servitude, or in the common law, a negative easement. That's not really a right to do anything with someone's property. It's just the right to stop them from using their property in certain ways. And a typical example would be the um, the practice of restrictive covenants, which people use when they have neighborhood or homeowners associations, and there's like a master planned agreement, and all the contiguous lots or units in this neighborhood. Um, are subject to restrictive covenants, which means there are certain things you can't use your home for. Like you can only use your home for certain residential uses, not commercial uses. Um, or you can't put a pig farm on your property, or you can't have a smokestack on your property, right? Or you can't have noise too loud, or you can't paint your house a garish color. Yeah. So these are not really rights to use. Your neighbors don't have the right to use your home, but they have the right to stop you from using it in a certain way. And again, those are contractually... Um, agreed upon, and so they're called negative servitudes or negative easements. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I've come to realize is that this is the best way to classify or to understand the nature of intellectual property rights or, or patent and copyright law. Basically what they do is is we have the government, the state, granting to someone a negative servitude over other people's property um, – so, for example, if I hold a patent, the government yeah. gives me the power to go to the government courts and use physical force or compulsion or coercion to stop someone else from using their property in a certain way. Now, that's a classical negative servitude. Yeah. And, and if it was contractually agreed upon by the burdened estate owner, that is by the person who is now restricted from using his body or his property in a certain way, there would be nothing wrong with it. Um, but the problem is the government simply grants this. So it's basically a taking of property. It's very similar to eminent domain. It's just that it's disguised because it's not a complete taking, unlike eminent domain, which would be the taking of someone's land or house or something like that. It's, it's, it's a subtle transfer of this negative servitude right, um, and it's done under the guise we call it intellectual property. So it sounds like it's a, a grant of property rights to someone, but mm -hmm. that's very similar to the positive negative rights distinction. If you grant someone a positive right, it sounds like you're just giving them something. But really, that's just a disguised way of saying we're limiting other people's negative rights because now they have an obligation to pay for this guy's education or housing or whatever, even though they never agreed to it. Um, so likewise, um, the, uh, these negative easements are granted by the state, and they call them patents and copyrights. But they basically amount to um, – Restrictions on how people can use their property. So I think to Tocqueville maybe was prescient here. I'd have to look at it in fuller context, but it seems like he was onto something, and he sees that this is a result of democracy. Um, previously, there were negative servitudes. It's called protectionism and, uh, and and censorship. Right? This was copyright and patents origins, protectionism, mercantilism, and thought control and censorship mm -hmm. by the state. But it wasn't confused with the property right, and everyone saw that it was. Done by the by the monarch or by the state or by the church, and they saw it as a as an infriction as an infringement on property rights. Maybe they had to put up with it, but there was no confusion about what it was. Right under democracy, it becomes institutionalized. It becomes subject to legislation, and it becomes woven into the fabric of capitalism and property rights, and even mislabeled as a property right. Right. So that everyone's confused about it. So we basically have a massive web of negative servitudes. Um. An example you and I were talking about was 3D printing. Imagine uh, some of the patents on the original <laughs> technology are about to expire, but how yeah. many other patents are coming up that cover 3D printing well, that are going to last for another 20 years? Well, yeah. So it's this web of restrictions that are going to last for, for decades that will slow down progress 
and freedom of action and um, freedom of innovation. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you can just look at look at cell phones and look at how far they've come along and. You know, um, it's amazing to think, uh, it's kind of, well, kind of crazy and sad at the same time to think about how far we could have been along technologically if we didn't have, um, some of these re restrictions in place. Of course, some people will say, um, you know, some people will say, well, if we didn't have all these restrictions, then nobody would, nobody would actually do anything because they couldn't make Correct. a living doing it, which is absolute nonsense as far as I'm concerned. But this sort of brings me to, uh, maybe a bit esoteric, but there was this funny article, um, called private property, the least bad option. And what was, what was kind of funny is that, um, he made some points and I actually was wondering about, you know, copyright or, or ideas being non-scarce in some ways, because, mm -hmm. well, I mean, he sort of starts off and he says, well, private property is a coercive structure stricture is what he says right um but uh and then he says then he goes on to say we would be better off much better off if we weren't tormented by scarcity what which of course again you know you know the the, the very he's sort of just talking about this weird utopian it's uh, it's more of a daydreaming piece i see i don't right, see, see it right. as being really anything important because um because he's just talking about like what if reality didn't exist that would be great, you know, like as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, who was – I forgot who was that by. Um, as uh, Joseph Diedrich is his name. Right. And I only – I think he had another piece out today which was arguing against IP. So um, I think he might be on the wrong track. I only skimmed that piece. Um, yeah. But it's sort of, but it's sort of funny because he says he says one thing. Um, he says a super abundant world does exist, however, in ideal resources, you know, uh, you know, ideas, patterns, concepts, words, expressions, information, knowledge, etc. But in some ways, I was sort of, you know, in my own mind, I was questioning that because I was sort of thinking, well, I mean, at the same time, you know, somebody in their mind knows how to, um, you know, let, let's say they might know how to actually make a uh you know, like an internal combustion engine is what he was saying right he was he was putting that and he actually used that exactly this is mm -hmm. that exact thing the same goes for the design of an internal combustion engine mm -hmm. um now now somebody might actually have that in their mind but even if that person told me that I, I probably would still have no idea how to use it you know like like knowledge in some ways like the knowledge that I have in my head is actually sort of unique to me in some ways, right? It is, right. it is right. this sort of like, it's, it's cause I'm a, I'm, you know, personally I'm scarce and the experiences that I have in my life are completely different from anybody else in the world. And so I actually particularly view things in a certain way and will put ideas together in a certain way. So in that way, like in some ways, like the, the particular thoughts that come out of my mm -hmm. head and the words mm -hmm. You could say that they are scarce, mm -hmm. right? Because they're filtered through my specific. And it, would that be something that Ayn Rand was sort of trying to get at when she was sort of talking about these things? I don't think so. Rand had a wholly different con uh, conception of the, the 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 purpose and nature of rights and how they're justified. Right. Um, which I think she was in conflict with in her own theory. When she talked in Atlas Shrugged about how no man has the right to initiate force, she was kind of talking the way you and I would talk about it. But when she tried to come up with this elaborate justification, she had this sort of overly metaphorical approach where the purpose of human life is productive achievement to do that. You need some property rights in the values that you create. Now, she's already going off the rails there because values are not things that exist. Values are subjective phenomena. So you see she's conflating. She's just kind of saying that if you create something that's of value, now you have a property right in it and you have to have protection. And therefore, mm -hmm. ideas have value. Therefore, there are property rights too. To me, it's a completely fallacious, confused um, confused argument. Um um, she should have focused on scarcity again and the purpose of property rights. So this 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 approach, I guess, the guy sounds like he's on the right track. He probably has different emphases than I do. For example, people people that a lot of minarchists that favor the state say that it's a necessary evil. Yeah, I've always been confused by that. If it's necessary, then it, it can't be evil. But you know, and likewise, this guy seems to be saying that property rights are the least bad option. Or they're a necessary evil. He seems to be implying. Yeah. Also, I, also, yeah. he's using the word coercion. If he uses the word as you as you indicated, probably uh, imprecisely, coercion is just 
um, a, uh, the threat, a type of threat of the use of physical force well, to, compel, yeah. to compel someone to do something. He says it is, it is not coercive in the sense of putting a gun to someone's head or stealing wealth in the form of taxes, but coercive in the sense that it circumscribes, dictates, and restricts our interaction with the natural physical world. Well, it's like, I'm sorry, so but... coercion, right. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. reality. I mean, the fact that I can't fly is not coercive in any sense. I, and again, it's simply this, this reality that I cannot it, fly. <laughs> yeah, and this highlights the problem with using being imprecise in your terms because a lot of libertarians will say that, oh, we believe in liberty and freedom. But if you're that vague about it, then you can have some leftists say, well, you're not free if you don't have any food in your stomach or you're not free if your employer can insist that you do something. And if you if you refuse and you get fired, then you're out of a job and you starve to death. You're not you're not really <laughs> free. So that's why I go back to property rights. Well, you know, I'm I'm going to become. Uh, I I was thinking about becoming a uh, a subsistence farmer, but I decided that the plants that I'm growing are actually going to be coercing me uh, because if I don't put labor into them and make them grow, then right. then that's coercion. Because yeah, so it's not coercion. <laughs> so there, there's two ways you can use coercion. A lot of libertarians use the word coercion as a synonym for aggression, which I think is imprecise. But at least if you're doing that, well, then the guy would still be wrong here because there's it's not a type of aggression when your options are limited by nature. Okay? Yeah, and yeah. or if you use it in the technically precise sense as a, a threat of force to compel behavior, it's not that either. It's not a threat by another human actor. Uh, you know, to use force against you or your or your legitimately acquired um, scarce resources. Right. So that's one problem with it. Now, I've written about this before, and I I have observed and acknowledged that, as as Hoppe has most explicitly and clearly pointed out, the world is a world of it's not a world of superabundance. It's a world of scarcity of means, which is implicit in Mises' human action. Right when he talks about. Um, human action is the choice of an end and the selection of scarce means to achieve that end. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the scarce means and, and the choice requires, and, and the and the selection of means both require knowledge. That's where the informational part comes in, which is what IP is directed at. Um, you you could say, I suppose. And what I, the way I put it, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say that it's a bad thing that we have scarcity. But it is a challenge in life. In other words, we live in a world of physical scarcity, and it's always a challenge to find energy, to find sustenance, to find food, to accomplish our goals. But to me, that's part of the far, you know, the fabric of life. That's the way reality is. And to well, say that it's a bad thing or that it's um, um, that it's unfortunate um, or it's a, a negative thing, to me, is to uh, posit some unimaginable hypothetical world of heaven or something or a world of uh, – unimaginable plenty that we we would all be ghosts with totally different characters identities in a world um, well and, and, I, and i would i would say that that was the problem you know that's sort of the problem with sort of i guess left libertarian sometimes or whatnot whatever they want to call themselves um is that they start sometimes you know with something like this it it makes them sound almost like the sort of classical um uh sort of utopian socialists of the 19th century who you know mm-hmm. marx sort of said well don't listen to those guys because they don't know what they're talking about right mm-hmm. you know they're they're trying to imagine if we had this world of, of you know no you know we imagine if we lived in a post-scarcity world and by the way you know the best way to live in a post-scarcity world is um Hey, <laughs> it's called socialism. Now follow me to my commune, and we'll we'll all live together in this yeah, wonderful course, post scarcity world. Work, they never work in reality, and we'll <laughs> never we'll never be in a post scarcity world because yeah. human action is characterized by the employment of scarce means. Uh, human action is literally inconceivable without scarcity of means. Um, and, and it also reminds me of these uh, naive utopian environmentalist wackos. Yeah, who 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 sort of want to take us back to this bucolic age of uh, uh, of man at one with nature, et cetera. And it's like they have no realistic conception of the of the basic horrors of living in nature before we had modern uh, comforts and defenses against it, and ways to conquer and manipulate and achieve what we've achieved. It's, it's they have this rosy notion of the past, which is unimaginably naive in in 
um, in, in my view. Mm-hmm. Um, or or so, simply evil because they want more people to die. Well, that's, that's the worst extreme of it, right? Uh, you even have these people called VHEMP, the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement. Yeah. They actually – <laughs> they want us to voluntarily not procreate and finally die off because we're you know we're a blight on nature. Um, well, and what we're natural. Well, and what's funny about that too is that, um, and and sort of you know more f- f- further down, this sort of uh, this sort of thing uh, in this article, he says something like, uh, "Immortality, unlimited space, and unlimited time would be would seem to be preferable to the opposite." <laughs> you know, but it's just sort of like. Well, it's it's just like a science fiction piece. I mean, as you said, we would cease to be human um, if if you know, like if if we lived in this, if yeah. we were omnipotent. If we were omnipotent, well, we would not be human. But what well, this goes to the point, though, um, and again, this sort of left libertarian or whatever they want to, you know, again, this left libertarian idea. There was a guy. Uh, I was at sort of a summer event. I think it was called the Liberty Summer Seminar a couple of summers ago. This guy, John uh, Tomasi, mm-hmm. uh, who you may have heard of, wrote a book called, uh, you know, Free Market Fairness. And mm-hmm. uh, so he was sort of giving a lecture about this and free market fairness this and free market fairness that. And, uh, and, then, I, and then I piped up and I asked him a question. I said, well, well, if nobody, you know, I said, who owns me? You know what I mean? Right. Basically, right. he was he was claiming, but he, and he actually just sort of dodged the question. It was kind mm-hmm. of funny. I said, mm-hmm. You know, because he was talking about these and negative, you know, negative rights. I guess he was he was trying to say that there were some sort of positive rights that could yep, be justified in some way. And then I, you know, and it was he was talking about ownership and well, nobody actually owns your you or whatever it was. And I said, well, you know, who? And it came down. I said, well, who owns me? And he said, oh, here, take a copy of my book. <laughs> That's sort yeah. of what I said, yeah. and this is sort of. It seems to me that they're they're trying to figure out a way to to justify positive rights in some way. Yeah, I think they are, and they're trying to have it both ways, and you can't. And they try to they try to glide over that with these. Look, they can they can play philosophical games because yeah. To my mind, the more precise question is who owns my body. Yes. And the libertarian answer is me because the body is a scarce resource. Now that's what we mean when we say self ownership or I own me, but. If you start talking like that, then these guys they'll just they'll just uh, be soph- sophistic and they'll just say, "Well, what you is is a social construct. It's not really clear what you is, and you don't have an owner because you is just a concept." Or, I mean, they can just they can just get away from the main issue and avoid admitting that they're basically in favor of a type of partial, either a par- type of partial slavery or a type of communism where everyone mm-hmm. owns a bit of each other, which makes no sense. It's got a circularity problem. Yeah. Um, well, and that's and that's the problem that I see with some of the, you know, I guess there's, you know, as let's call it libertarianism or, you know, whatever, because of Ron Paul and because it's sort of growing uh, in influence or growing in, mm-hmm. I guess people just are coming to it. And they're like, oh, this is interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, you do, we do have these problems where I guess, you know, and I, I mean, Jeffrey Tucker, I, I had a brief conversation about, about it. You know, Jeffrey Tucker might call, you know, somebody a brutalist or something, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you might say, well, you know, why should we be in favor of, you know, using the language like privilege, you know, in, in the way that, say, Kathy Reisenwitz might mm-hmm. start talking about, oh, well, we need to think about privilege. Well, you know, the people who are using the term privilege, as far as I can tell, are Marxists. You know what I mean? It seems to be almost adopting this sort of Marxist uh, language and leftist or collectivist language. Um, and to bring it into bring it into libertarianism. I, I think I think that may be part of what, like the bleeding heart libertarians and uh, Matt Zwolinski. Well, I don't I don't uh, even know why they call themselves libertarians. Really, well, that's but. that's enough. That's another issue. So <laughs> I mean, some, some some of them are like Roderick Long, but uh, yeah. I think what, what they're, they're trying to do something. Uh, there was uh, there was a little discussion of some of this um, on. Um, on I think it was the the uh, the Cato libertarianism podcast with Aaron Powell, I think. And, and, oh, the and guest, just, the just guest to was, let you know, this is going to, this is going to go into overdrive people. So catch the rest of this on the red than dead.com website on iTunes and on Stitcher. So continue on uh, stepping. Yeah. I just say it, uh, just a couple days ago and today is what April uh, 16th. The, yeah, yeah. Day after tax day. Or, um, anyway, uh, in the U S um, uh, and the guest was Arnold Kling, and he's he's got this interesting breakdown of of the three languages of politics, and he he identifies the three basic political groups as the progressives, 
the conservatives and the libertarians. And he says that they each have a different polar way of speaking about what 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 they think the most evil thing is and what the best thing is. Mm -hmm. And the progressives basically think the most evil thing is oppressing people. And, you know, so they do they, their axis is oppressed versus oppressor. The conservatives is uh, uh, barbarism versus civilization, right? And then the libertarians is coercion versus freedom. So it's an interesting way of looking at it. And what he points out is that if you just try to adopt the language of one of these other groups, um, like I think uh, some of these left libertarians and like maybe Reisenwitz with their privilege talk and the bleeding heart libertarians with their uh, with their so that's authoritarianism our show for the talk and their oppression it's talk. A good day. They're trying to appeal to the progressives by using their language. Yes, but it's not going to work because no, these other people aren't stupid and they're going to see that you're a wolf in <laughs> sheep's clothing, just trying to subtly manipulate them. That's I don't think that's going to work. Uh, and anyway, if it is, that's not my specialty. But let mm -hmm. me mention one other thing about the, um, the, the Diedrich thing. I, I guess you could put it the way that uh, property rights are the least bad option. To me, that's a question of emphasis. I would say it's the only workable and good option. I guess you could say that glass is half empty. I would say it's half full, and they're both accurate physical descriptions. I'm just reluctant to say it's a it's a it's a it's a um, it's a least bad option because it implies it's still a bad option, but I don't think it is a bad option. It is a very great thing that we come out of sort of primitive human society and we come together in civilization and we, by and large, have rules that are designed to let us use scarce resources peacefully and productively and cooperatively. That's what property rights are for. It's to basically remove one barrier to human action. The barrier of scarcity is always going to be there, mm -hmm. um, and if you have other people trying to forcefully take your things from you, that is to have conflict, that's another barrier to successful human action. You're going to spend your time fighting or get killed uh, and not be able to use these resources productively because two or more people are physically fighting over the use of those resources. If you come up with a workable system to assign the right to use these things so that you can minimize or reduce or even get rid of conflict… That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So I'm reluctant to call it a bad thing because it's going to feed into um, – and also the only reason to call it a bad thing, again, is if you have this conception of a better utopian society. But I think these things are virtually unimaginable. It's almost like Rothbard's uh, evenly rotating economy. It's sort of this hypothetical construct that is not real because – it, it, it's almost unimaginable, right? Like it's unimaginable to have an acting being in a world of non-scarcity because if you have no scarcity, you couldn't act. So it's well, almost, yeah. it's almost yeah. an impossible, well, logical scenario. If I was, yeah, if I was in all places at all times, I, I exactly, I wouldn't be a human being anymore. <laughs> I would, I would be that, something it, it else. Almost, it almost means nothing to say that because it's not well, defined, you know. Yeah, exactly, and and I mean, and that, well, this is the whole key, right? Is that um, you know, reality does exist as far as I'm concerned. But well, since, and, and that's and that's the purpose of philosophy and all these political um, discussions is to find a way that you can sur exist in a satisfying, good way in reality. Yes. So to come up with this hypothetical that can never exist and cannot even be defined, I think is the totally wrong approach. Yeah. Unless you do that, you have no reason to disparage property rights as the least bad option. It's not a bad option. It's a good option. Well, and that's sort of what I dis I think I was having a conversation with somebody a few months ago, and I said, you know, and, you know, sort of either progressives or, you know, whatever conservatives or let's say libertarians, just let's say those three, um, like I said, you your your intellectual framework, the way that you view the world, um, I mean, that's sort of what you do. I mean, you know, because you it's it's how you think the world works, right? Right. right. Um, you know, because you wake up in the morning, you're like going to go walking down the street, and you 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 know you you think you have to watch out for certain things. You should be afraid of certain things, and and a progressive might think you should be afraid of different things. And this is the way I should organize my life in order to respond to. You know what I need to do, what I need to get, what I should be afraid of, what I should like—all uh, those sorts of different things, right? So it is really a way of organizing reality. Yeah, and you you could say, as as a common sense human being, you could say it would be better for me and for most people I know, for maybe everyone, if there was more plentifulness, if scarcity was in a sense reduced. Mm -hmm. It would be better if people didn't fight with each other. So there's the only way to to achieve the first goal is to have production and increased efficiency and the division of labor and trade. And the only way to solve the second problem is to have a system of agreed-upon social rules 
where people by and large agree not to violate, not to have conflict with each other by respecting property rights. Mm-hmm. So this is just the social you know we, we face technological problems, technical problems, we face scarcity problems, and we face conflict problems, and there are ways to reduce or overcome those problems well what's funny about that you about you saying production and uh of course what uh what the socialist of course once once said was and the communist once said was that you know well once we, once we implement you know capitalism is wasteful uh once we implement socialism it will be far more um will be far more efficient because uh you right. know we'll we'll you know the capitalists won't be extract extracting all this excess labor right. uh, out of the system and we'll have much more and yeah, you won't have a uh, redundant c- competition you won't have advertising waste all that kind of stuff well yeah and what's funny though is that uh you know with the fall of soviet union and you know the sort of collapse of sort of that you know that sort of actually existing you know you know full on socialism um, it be, very, became very clear that, of course, exactly the opposite was right. true, is that right. socialism produced poverty. And what's hilarious is that so many of these socialists then, of course, went into the, you know, flipping back to the environmental movement. A lot of them yes. moved into the environmental movement yes. and now say that socialism essentially is good and collectivism yes. is good because it doesn't produce as much. I agree. <laughs> I agree completely. That, that's the impression. The impression I get is the original socialists did want material prosperity. Oh, absolutely. Budget. Yeah. They were just wrong about the means to achieve it. And when it became clear that the means to achieve it that they propounded, which was you know centralized control of the economy, was not going to work, instead of saying we were wrong, let's find a different way to achieve material prosperity and abundance, which would be capitalism. Mm-hmm. They 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 changed their they changed their the goalpost. They said, well, that's not really the goal anyway. Yeah, it's some other goal. <laughs> Well, which comes down, which really, in in some ways, for me, it it, it really is collectivism versus individualism. Um, uh, and and discussing this stuff further, uh, you know, it's because we're sort of touching on the Marxists and collectivists and these sorts of things. Um, I understand that somehow that Hans Hermann Hoppe, who's sort of a leading, you know, Rothbardian uh, anarcho capitalist, once said that uh, the Marxists the Marxists were basically right. And I don't was he giving the was he giving the Marxists too much uh, credit there? No, I think I think so. Uh, he has this essay about um, I think it's Marxist and Austrian class analysis, mm-hmm. and uh, I've got a blog post about it which I can send you the link to. Um, he basically argues that the Marxists were essentially correct. They had a fundamental error, which was their concept of exploitation, right? Um, and that was based upon their um, their their fallacious economics, which is based upon the labor theory of value, which leads them to believe that. Um, you know, when there's a capitalist or an employer who makes a profit, that they they're kind of they're exploiting or stealing the surplus labor from the workers. Now, what about um, the now? Just just quickly now, but mm-hmm. what about the whole dialectical Marxism thing? You know, the the Kantian, you know, synthesis and antithesis coming together and forming, and you know, we're at some point we're going to re- reach the end of history. Obviously, Hoppe wasn't sort of agreeing that there would be some sort of. He wasn't agreeing right, with that. He was right. more talking about the economic, he was the class the, analysis part of it. Yeah, the, the basic class struggle, like how there's an exploiting class and there's a, a, a dominated or exploited class. Right. And 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 and, and the different uh, stage, the different uh, ways that they uh, that the, the this central exploiting class comes to dominate the others. And the only the the main problem with the Marxian analysis is that they view exploitation as this. Um, this capitalist profit because of their their flawed economics, and what Hoppe points out is mm-hmm. that you know that economics is wrong, as we know we know now they yes. should have known then, but especially with with Mises and, and Austrian economics to to guide us well that I mean, but they were coming out I mean Marx in a lot of ways was like the last classical economist wasn 't he I mean he was following in uh, you know because Adam Smith certainly believed in the labor theory of value as well didn 't he yeah and 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 you could even find traces of it in this in, in like Locke and his labor theory of property, which is I think somewhat related to the labor theory of value, which right. leads, which also leads to confusion about um, the nature of property rights and leads to intellectual property. So I think this labor, this whole labor metaphor, has led to lots of confusion in both economics and political theory. Uh, it's led to intellectual property. It's led to the exploitation theory of the Marxist. Um, it's led to the labor theory of value. So Hoppe basically says if you understand that exploitation is simply an act of aggression, that is the invasion of the borders of mm-hmm. or the unconsented use of um, a scarce resource that 
which is either someone's body or some other external scarce resource that they have acquired legitimately. That is either by original appropriation, according to Locke, or by contract from a previous owner. So basically, aggression is what exploitation genuinely is. And if you understand it that way, then you see that the, the true exploiting um, exploiter is the state, because the state is institutionalized aggression against private property rights. Um, mm -hmm. So once you understand it that way, then you see that the class struggle is a struggle of the exploiting parasitical class, which is the state and its hangers-on, its, you know, its crony capitalist um, uh, uh, buddies. And, and, also, right. and, and then the, the exploited class is the taxpayers, the productive people who work in the, in the kind of semi-free market economy that the state permits to exist and that it parasitically uh, lives off of. So that was his point, and I think uh, this came up, and I've blogged on this before, but I think Thomas Knapp, who I think is a kind of left libertarian on the Libertarian Alliance blog, Sean Gabb's blog, um, and a couple, a couple days ago had blogged mm -hmm. about how um, he agreed with Hoppe's paper, even though uh, he's not a fan of Hoppe because the left libertarians characterize him as a, as a right libertarian. Um, but he said the only difference is he would say that um, – um, it's okay that employers exploit their workers and the workers also exploit their employers. I think that's a dangerous equivocation there because he's using the word exploit in a neutral sense. He basically means to employ or to benefit from. But the word exploit, as you well, yeah, because you can because you can exploit. say, yeah. Well, I mean, you can say I'm exploiting the resources, you know, of of this certain yes. area, and and so all that means is to, I'm digging, you know, I'm cutting down a couple trees. Yeah. You so know? you have to be clear on your connotations because if you say I admit that employers are exploiting their workers, and you mean exploiting in a neutral sense or even in a good sense, and then the Marxists will say, aha, you're admitting that there's exploitation, which they mean in a pejorative evil sense. Mm -hmm. So there's a danger of equivocation there, not not by Knapp, but by people that are going to try to do everything they can to muddy the waters and to argue for the state and for the yeah. wrong thing. So you have to be really clear with your, your terms and not let them get away with it. Equivocation, I'm starting to see, is one of the biggest dangers we face in political discourse, um, and that comes from unclear definitions and the uh, overuse of metaphorical, overly loose flowery sort of language um well i mean of course i mean politicians are always going to want to equivocate because <laughs> they don't want to ever they don't ever want to be held to a certain standard right i mean well, imagine know, the gold a presidential candidate like uh, you know uh, imagine a republican presidential candidate debating a democrat admitting that uh that uh, that employers exploit the workers and that's a good thing <laughs> i mean it just wouldn't go over well yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I guess I, you know, uh, I find that some of the writers, you know, who work for Mises.ca are, are very good writers, and I'm exploiting oh, the, these guys. I'm exploiting their, uh, you know, their skills to right. to bring more people in to read Mises right. Canada. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like it's exactly. absolutely, it's absolutely ridiculous, and especially, yeah, and especially it's. I mean, I guess these these terms over time. Or sort of you could say I'm use, I'm using them. Well, you are using them in a way, but you're not even using that. Them even that is oftentimes things. using a. Even that oftentimes is a pejorative. You know, what I mean? I'm using them. No, well, yes. no, I I employ them. There, I think the proper term in any of these cases is you know I employing them. You know, I've come to an agreement with them that they will do a certain thing. I will pay them a certain wage. And that's it. You know, if, if they don't want to do that, that's fine. Then I just won't employ them. <laughs> you know, yeah. Explain. What's what's interesting is Mises in Human Action. Um, he talks about scarce means, the means of action, and by that he means things that are naturally scarce in the world that you need to employ to affect a causal change. That is, these are causally efficacious things in the world, external resources that can help you achieve what you want. They can change the course of events. But mm -hmm. he also admits that in a division of labor. Uh, other humans serve as means. Now, I think his meaning is subtly different there. He doesn't mean that you own them like a, like a scarce resource, but they do help you achieve what you want to achieve. If you employ someone to bake a cake for you, you're taking advantage of the division of labor and trade and commerce to get something done that you want done. So one means to achieve your goals is to work with other people and to uh, use the division of labor. Um, mm -hmm. So that's an interesting sort of uh, terminological thing Mises does there where he, he extends the concept of means to cover, to cover other human beings that you can cooperate with and trade with. 
Well, exactly. And I think that's, you know, that's sort of the whole point. I mean, that's the point of capitalism that we, that we work together. We extend the division of labor. I mean, and that's why I think that, um, you know, uh, I guess what, I guess what the, the labor unions and the left would sort of critique as being, you know, globalism, um, you know, the dropping of trade barriers and these sorts of things. I just see that as, as increasing the division of labor to a global scale. And I, yeah, I don't and, think and, and, wrong with and, that. and this this gets to the Marxist concept of alienation, okay? No. Which is another <laughs> false, uh, flawed concept, which some of the left libertarians seem to buy into a little bit when they yeah. talk about this uh, this ideal rosy world of self sufficiency, and you kind of live in a little village, and uh, everything is local. There's no sh- fruit ship from New Zealand, and um, it's like they have a kind of aversion to globally extending the division of labor and also specialization of labor where people specialize on a certain task because they think you know you can get alienated from that or you're you're not self-sufficient or you're just doing some monotonous task that you don't feel connected with etc you know what would be you know would be a monotonous task farming (laughs) being a subsistence farmer who did who spent every waking hour every waking minute um, being self-sufficient in all ways, that would be incredibly well, <laughs> alienating. Right. So, the, so, the, so the, the left libertarians sort of try to have it both ways because they imagine a future state where we take advantage of all this open source advanced capitalist technology, which lets you just have a little generator on your in your backyard and grow your own little hydroponic pods and – you know, and you have a lot of leisure time, so they have this sort of rosy view of things. Now, maybe something like that will come to pass. Well, what, be what, what, what was what did Marx say? You'd be a you'd be a farmer in the morning, a uh, a writer in the evening, a hunter in the afternoon, or something like that. Something like that. <laughs> I, think, I think Marx was saying he was saying when when com- when communism comes about, that's what we'll have. Uh, but what, of course, what's hilarious about it is that uh, you know when you when you have this world where I mean, what's hilarious about it is that in some ways capitalism is almost. I mean, that's exactly what capitalism would eventually produce. Yeah, I think right? so too. Um, is that yeah, gradually uh, reduce the number of hours you need to work because of efficiency will and productivity will increase? Well, I some mean, even some might people some might. Hours. Well, I was going to say some might people were. were it might say that we're already there, um, you know, given that, uh, you know, you've got 50 million people on food stamps um, in the United States. I mean, a hundred years ago when Marx was alive writing this stuff, um, something like, uh, you know, so let's say 60, 70 percent of the population in the United States was involved in farming, you know, right. simply to provide food so that people could live. You know, if, if they weren't 60, 70 percent of the people weren't farming, they would be starving. Uh, you know, you'd have a popula- portion of the population starving. Now we're to the point where one to two percent of the population is involved in farming, feeds the entire population of the United States and exports food, you know. Yeah, or, or take your, your average middle class person, say, in the West today. Yeah. Um, they, they can earn a decent living from specializing and working a certain number of hours a week, but they have much more free time. They, and they have other pursuits and hobbies that, you know, they might paint on the side or take an art class or they might get into wine collecting or, you know, becoming a, a tennis nut. So people are already using their leisure time, which, you know, capitalism has given us yes. um, to, yeah. to, to do one thing in the morning and one thing in the evening. Um, and it would be more and better if the government didn't expropriate so much, such a big cut of what we're producing already. It w- we'd probably be multiple times richer if the government would just go down by, you know, sixty uh, percent or something. Ninety percent. Oh yeah, I know. It's it's amazing how much. It's amazing how much productivity. But I think a lot of that comes from, you know, like we were talking about before this interview, um, sort of protectionism and whatnot, and people wanting to protect their little their little fiefdoms and whatnot and using the government to do it. You know, um, they're saying it's, it's the old, uh, and I've even had debates with people who should know better. The old idea that, um, you know, robots will take all our jobs. Right. <laughs> you know, right. The, I or mean, these people, or whatever. Oh, they just, they just sound like Luddites, you know, like really, really, you, you would rather we, you know, it's, it's the, there's only so many jobs in the world. Oh, we, we need, we need, we need to make sure that there's enough jobs for people. <laughs> Yeah, kind of I think we we, ba- we basically have we have a version of a prisoner's dilemma in society. Yeah, uh, and it's created by the existence of the state, a democratic state where people can all lobby the state and bribe it for protection in their little industry. So, you, the prisoner's dilemma is that you know you'd almost be irrational not to lobby the state for your piece of the pie or your protection because everyone else is doing it to you. 
Yeah. Um, you, you really can't expect people not to take advantage of the state when I mean, okay, you got one percent of the population might be principled, diehard libertarians who just refuse to do it to their own detriment in some in some way. But not, you can't expect that tendency to survive or to, to be widespread. Well, I was I was having a conversation earlier yesterday with uh, a woman named Kathy Shadle, and we were sort of discussing that point because, you know. Um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, these sort of cultural Marxists are perfectly happy to use the, the state to sort of create these things like, um, you know, the Ontario Tribunal on Human Rights or whatever right. it is, which right. just, which these things, these things seem to be organized to just, you know, destroy freedom, you know, free association, destroy free speech, um, you know, all these sorts of things. And they have no problem using all these tools to, you know, essentially what I would say is sort of in the same way the communists destroyed the economic system, they destroyed the social system in some ways. Well, when it, when anyone starts talking about human rights, I get really nervous because yeah. <laughs> that's a, 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 ca a catchphrase for this plethora of positive welfare rights and, and related. Uh, it's whatever uh, they want just rights. so they can get power. But anyways, you were going to say about people not – and you were going to continue about people uh, choosing not to use these tools. Well, no, I just, I'm just saying the existence of the state creates a situation where, especially a democratic state, where uh, conflicts among different classes is inevitable, right? You're going to have basically a war of all against all, which is the opposite of what civilization is supposed to be about. Well, yeah. So, you know, the, the smaller the state, the less need there is to do that. Well, uh, you know, yeah, and, and I would say that, and I've said this, I would think I had this said this to, um, uh, Stefan Molno a little while ago, I was having a conversation with him saying that, you know, essentially, uh, government in a lot of ways is the, is the ultimate tragedy of the commons. I yes. mean, it is a tragedy of the commons. That's the problem yeah. is that it, it's this common thing that everyone's trying to use to their own ends. And, uh, and, and let's just, let's just finish this off by sort of just touching on this whole HAPA and immigration thing since we were discussing it. And, um, I guess some, People, again, within the, you know, I, I hate to use the term libertarian, you know, the, the liberty movement, the freedom mm -hmm. movement, because I mm -hmm. don't really consider, I mean, I guess I'm such a radical individualist that I don't consider myself to be part of any movement. But, um, you know, they complain, well, Hoppe doesn't like immigration. Well, you know, if the idea is that we reduce the state to the smallest size and that we have, you know, total private ownership of all means of production, of all land, of all these sorts of things, essentially immigration, as we know it today, would not exist. Is is that sort of what he's getting at? Well, I think um, I think Hoppe he's he's an anarchist libertarian like like you and I are. So his mm -hmm. his his preferred situation is a society, a world where enough people recognize that aggression is wrong and the state commits aggression, so that states wouldn't have perceived legitimacy and they wouldn't be able to exist anymore. Yeah. And if you didn't have states, then you would the the entire idea of immigration would be wouldn't make sense because there wouldn't be national borders, there wouldn't be a policy, there would just be property owners and each one would have the right to invite whoever they wanted to their property. Uh, mm -hmm. Etc. So you just have free movement of people so long as property owners consented to it. Exactly. His, yeah. his main point well, first of all, he thinks the state should be abolished. He's also a decentralist, so he thinks that you know, to the extent there's immigration control, say in the U.S., it should be it should be reduced to a lower level, like to the states or to towns, and ultimately to the individual, which is a, a libertarian decentralist idea. But his point is is that if you just, as a libertarian, say we have an existing state system and the government shouldn't have immigration controls. Um, well, if the government has immigration controls, it does violate rights. So if I want to invite someone to my land or my factory to work there and I'm not permitted to because of immigration law, that is a violation of my rights to use my property as I see fit. Yes. And Han Hoppe admits this, and in fact that's why he says that if there's going to be immigration controls, um, as long as someone's invited, they should be permitted to come. So he admits this. So that's the main case of violation of rights is when someone who's invited – is not permitted to come. So he thinks that that should not be prohibited. Mm -hmm. But he's also pointing out that if the government – so if the government has closed borders or limits immigration, some people's rights are violated. That could be ameliorated by requiring someone to be allowed if they have an invite, an invitation from some property owner. Um, but he also points out if the government takes an open borders policy and maintains its, um, its anti-discrimination laws, its system of public roads, its uh, affirmative action laws – Mm -hmm. uh, its welfare state, then someone's rights are violated that way too because uh, now you get a phenomenon he calls forced integration. So I see nothing wrong with a social philosopher uh, analyzing 
the consequences of the state's existence and the state's interference with society. So if, if they do one thing, they violate rights. If they do another thing, they violate rights. This is why we shouldn't have a state in the first place, because there are no winners in some situations. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, these are tough issues sometimes. And, and I think it's sort of funny because, I mean, this is the whole idea, um, you know, that states create I mean, and the the funny thing, of course, is that the idea, and I guess this is why he touches on things like a monarchy and these sorts of things, because I guess the whole idea is that uh, states are an organization of people and the, the people who, and I think this is why you have to get back to libertarian class analysis, I think, is that you really need to, again, the state, collectives in my mind really don't exist. You know, you really have to think about, okay, well, who is controlling the state, right? It's a group of certain people, you know, and within the borders of, you know, the territor- territorial monopoly on ultimate decision making, I guess, as he would put it. You know, they they take a certain group of citizens, a certain group of individuals again, and confer on them this designation known as a citizen. Right now, the right. citizen has you you get a certain and a certain a citizen who is a certain class of person, a certain mm-hmm. class of individual that we have decided upon. Well, you will get certain um, benefits, you know, of being a citizen as we have decided it. You know, right. and this is a, just another way of conferring you know, positive rights on a certain group of individuals, you know, as a, as against another certain group of individuals. Right. Yeah. And the reason he brings up monarchy is this number one, he's explicitly said he's not in favor of monarchy. He's an anarchist. Mm-hmm. Um, his point is twofold. Number one, to, to step back and rethink this assumption. A lot of libertarians have most libertarians are not in favor of democracy, but they, they sort of accept the, the idea that uh, the, the transition from monarchies, Around World War One time to the modern, more democratic system was a step of progress, was a movement towards a more legitimate liberal uh, society. And he's pointing out that that it was actually it was actually retrogression in some ways. And he does that by by explaining the incentives faced by monarchs versus democratic leaders. How well, democratic yeah. leaders have a lot more short sighted incentives, and uh, monarchs have more of an incentive to maximize the actual economic value of the country that they're basically a a kind of a quasi owner of Mm -hmm. now he's not in favor of that but he's pointing out that if you are wondering what policy a state ought to have for immigration um, short of abolishing the state which he's in favor of it might be helpful to imagine an ideal society which is a cat which is a, a an anarcho capitalist world where everyone is a property owner and can make invitations to people to their land mm-hmm. and to and to imagine how they would act and then let's look at the incentives a, a democratic state would have about setting their immigration policy versus the incentives a monarch would have and his point is that the monarch would probably adopt an immigration policy closer to what you would have in a in a anarchistic society than the, than the democratic states would do because the democratic states just want to get in voters who are going to need their you know need their the welfare support they're going to vote for the government etc so they, they don't care about the quality of the people they're letting in whether they're law abiding that kind of thing or they don't care as much as a private owner would so mm-hmm. he's just using the idea of monarchy as number one to say that don't don't assume that the, the progression from monarchy to democrat, democracy was progress or unalloyed progress. Mm-hmm. And number two, if you imagine the policies a monarch would implement, they're probably closer to what would result in a free society. And that ought to give you pause when you're trying to think of what second best policies – our democratic states should should implement. Well, certainly it seems to me that we now ex- sort of reside in uh, sort of this unlimited totalitarian democracy where, <laughs> you know, uh, at least in Canada, you know, a relatively small percentage of the population, you know, quote unquote, votes for a political party. And then that vote, that political party gets to impose its will on the entire population, right. you know, and, and do whatever it sees fit for, you know, four years, you know, or whatever it thinks it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's whatever it thinks it's entitled to. And it's to, it really is to a point where, you know, as Bastia said, everybody's just trying to loot each other. You know, everybody's just trying to loot everybody else. You yep. know, and it's, and it is kind of funny as, as Stefan Paul, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it is sort of funny cause you know, we teach in kindergarten, you know, don't hit, don't steal. But then mm-hmm. at some point, uh, it sort of transitions to, 
well, hit that person so I can steal from him for me. Yep. 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 <laughs> and, yeah, you're right. And going back to that classic uh, Benjamin Franklin quote, uh, when the people find that they can vote themselves money, that will herald the end of the republic. That's a, that's a, that's a insightful point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, man. Anyways, uh, but we should we should discuss this further because I um, because we have been going for a while now, and I I do want to let you go. But I would like to discuss this idea of monarchy a bit further because um, I think it is because that is in some ways I think the monarch uh, at least at some point saw themselves as the owner of that particular piece of land, and you know, they, and I think that was the whole point, right? And I know that my own, I think my own. Uh, uh, ancestors at one point, um, they had moved from Germany to Hungary and they were, yeah, they were invited by a monarch. This monarch said, we need, you know, this got all this empty land, come on down and start farming in Hungary. But anyway, Stefan, uh, I guess where are the websites, um, what are the websites we can, we can check out to, uh, they can find all my stuff at just Stefan So, uh, and that links to the other things I'm doing like C4SIF.org and libertarianpapers.org. Excellent, man. Okay, thanks again, and uh, let's talk soon. Thanks, man. Okay, bye.